Okay, so today's lecture concerns Pennsylvania and the American Revolution. And when we look at the American Revolution, it's noticeable that Pennsylvania's support for it didn't come as easily as its place in history may suggest. Uh, the province's ruling elite, the prosperous Quakers, who resided in the eastern counties and had strong ties to the crown, slowed Pennsylvania's participation in the growing rebellion, but they couldn't ultimately prevent it. A group of educated young men who adamantly argued for independence uh, included um, Thomas Paine and Benjamin Rush, and these men inspired common Pennsylvanians through their pamphlets and speeches to believe in and work for the Patriot cause. Across the province, farmers, merchants and labourers formed committees of correspondence and safety. They raised volunteer militia companies and they provided soldiers for the Continental Army and food and weapons more widely for the American war effort. Pennsylvania's Continental soldiers formed into 18 regiments and they fought the British in each of the 13 states and Canada. But before we look at Pennsylvania itself, um, I just want to look at very briefly um, Pennsylvania and the American Revolution um, in its broader context. Okay, so as I say, before examining the role of Pennsylvania and the effect of the revolution in Pennsylvania, it's worth recapping on the historical events that led the American colonies to declare fight and win their independence from Great Britain. Britain, of course, was an 18th century superpower. Uh, the first thing to note is that the great victory that Britain achieved in the French and Indian War, and Seven Years' War as it became known, came at enormous financial cost. The British Treasury spent £7.5 million prosecuting the war in America alone, and the cost of the war as a whole averaged £13,700,000 per year. Britain's national debt almost doubled after 1756, reaching £132,600,000 in 1763. Interest payments alone on this total would be £5 million per annum. And then of course came the additional cost of maintaining troops, 10,000 troops initially and in Canada and Florida to protect those recently conquered acquisitions. Uh, this the cost of this amounted to around £250,000 annually. Uh, now, after 1764, the number of troops needed did reduce to 7,500, but nonetheless, this is a sizable total, uh, particularly considering uh, that Britain historically didn't like standing armies and certainly didn't like deploying them permanently abroad. In terms of the modern value um, of this enormous debt, um, I think it comes out at around four billion pounds. We multiply, multiply by 25 to 30, but that total doesn't tell us the full story because while government borrowing on this scale uh, is in fact quite normal now, and in fact, in, in reality, of course, we have much larger government borrowing in the present day. This wasn't really the case back in the 18th century. So the national debts by the standard of the 18th century were in fact rather dangerous, crippling in fact, and the mounting costs were causing great unease within Britain itself. The question then arises, who is going to pay for it all? Now, up until this point, the British at home felt that they had paid enough. At the end of the Seven Years' War, land taxes in Britain were 25% of annual inc income, and MPs, many of them landowners of course, were clamouring for a reduction. There were also excise duties on beer and cider that retrospectively, or I should say respectively, caused riots in London in 1760 and the West Country in 1763. Now, to the hard-pressed British, it seemed like common sense that the American colonists should defray at least some of the cost of a war that had seemingly benefited them so much. The war itself had also, of course, heightened a perception in Britain that the colonies were unruly and insubordinate and needed more generally to be brought into line. <clears throat> 
In fact, as you remember from one of the previous lectures, uh, in the early stages of the French and Indian War, no colonies had fully complied with Whitehall's request for men and supplies, and some had provided none at all. Uh, British commanders in the field, like Edward Braddock, for instance, all uh, bemoaned the shortage of equipment that was provided by the colonists. They disliked the short terms of militiamen service, and generally they saw the Americans as ill-disciplined, and they disliked, the British Army certainly disliked serving alongside colonial American soldiers. More generally, the colonists, for various reasons, were reluctant to provide sli uh, s supplies and indeed to uh, billet British soldiers. Now, for the British, they believe that with so many people, so much wealth, so much trade, that the colonists could indeed pay their way a little bit more than they had to. Thus it was that on the 5th of April 1764, Parliament passed the first of many acts designed to tax the colonies. Now, the first you can see there on the slide was called the American Duties Act or Revenue Act, but it's most commonly called the Sugar Act. And that Sugar Act was the first of the taxes and other parliamentary measures that we can see in hindsight led to American independence in 1776 or the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Uh, the Sugar Act itself um, imposed a three pence per gallon duty on molasses, rum and sugar imported into the American colonies. And it had in fact replaced the six pence duty of the Molasses Act, the earlier Molasses Act of 1733. Uh, that had been designed to deter trade with the French sugar islands of the Caribbean. Now under the um, Sugar Act, the Royal Navy became empowered to search American ships at will, and smugglers, if they were caught, would be tried in vice admiralty courts with no juries. And this, of course, the right to a trial by jury was a cornerstone and is a cornerstone of the English legal system. Now, because it was a direct tax placed on the Americans by the British Parliament, the colonists strongly objected and there emerged the now famous cry of no taxation without representation. This was an especially important principle in the 18th century because property was the foundation of personal independence. It gave in brief freedom from the will of others. Personal independence, it must be remembered, was also the foundation of liberty itself. So in a very real sense, property equaled liberty. And taking away your property, in this case through direct taxation, without your consent, meant taking away liberty itself. Now, many Britons responded that even if the Americans had no MPs in the British Parliament that had passed the Sugar uh, and later the Stamp Acts, uh, and, and weren't therefore directly or actually represented, they nevertheless enjoyed what was called virtual representation because every MP represented not only his own voters, but also every British subject everywhere. The colonists, however, believed that they were representative well enough in their own individual houses of assembly, which in their minds supplanted the British Parliament in each of the colonies. Thus, an argument over taxation soon turned into one over the very constitution of the British Empire, one of parliamentary uh, sovereignty pitted against diffused sovereignty, as the Americans felt they had historically enjoyed. Now, as I just mentioned, the next year, a particularly contentious act, the Stamp Act, 1765, um, came into being. Now the Stamp Act directed that as of the 1st of November 1765, all legally licensed documents, including private contracts, newspapers, pamphlets, even cards and dice, had to be written on or accompanied by stamped paper issued from London. The colonists, who were already angry about the Sugar Act, don't forget, and were well informed in advance of the Stamp Act, 
in time rendered the measure unenforceable, and in fact they did so before it was supposed to come into effect. Uh, first, mobs or crowds of protesters intimidated stamp collectors so that all of them in every colony resigned their posts by November. Also, Sons of Liberty groups sprang up throughout the colonies, organising, for instance, the writing and distributing of pamphlet propaganda. They also enforced a non-importation agreement against British goods. And finally, what we see in response to the Stamp Act is that politicians from 10 of the 13 North American mainland colonies that would later go on to declare independence met in New York as the Stamp Act Congress from the 3rd, um, uh, from the 3rd to the 25th of October 1765. And they essentially petitioned the British Parliament to repeal the Act. Now, because of the pressure that was brought to bear, especially on stamp tax collectors, uh, on the 16th of March 1766, Parliament repealed the Stamp Act. And they didn't make a penny of it, in case you were wondering. And in response to these colonial protests, especially virulent after the Stamp Act, Parliament also uh, would later reduce the sugar duty to one pence per gallon. The next major crisis on this revolutionary timeline came when Parliament passed the so-called Townsend Duties. They were named after the Chancellor of the Exchequer and later Prime Minister, uh, Charles Townsend. Uh, these duties required colonists to pay imported taxes on various goods, uh, including glass, lead, paint, paper and tea, things in short that they couldn't make themselves. Townsend also hoped that by establishing a board of customs commissioners made up of British Treasury officials rather than local people, he would get around the problem that was uh, faced by the stamp collectors in 1765. They were locals, they were easy to intimidate. But once again the colonists subjected to what they called no taxation without representation and they, they did so in all of the same ways that they objected to the Stamp Act. But recalling the Declaratory Act in which the British Parliament had asserted its supremacy, the colonists' objections also included explicit claims that political sovereignty was and always had been diffused throughout the empire and that therefore the colonial lowers, lower houses of assembly were in fact the equivalent to the House of Commons. Now this outraged the British who saw it an as an assault on their vision of the constitution of the British Empire and they responded by closing down colonial legislatures. When the Massachusetts Assembly for instance uh, sent a circular letter to other colonial legislatures objecting to the Townsend duties Parliament ordered colonial governors to close down any colonial assemblies that endorsed the letter. When the New York Assembly uh, refused to pay for the billeting of British soldiers, Parliament ordered the governor of that colony to veto all of the assembly's legislation. So what we have is a gradual deterioration in Anglo-American relations. And on this line, I think it's fair to say, in October of 1768, uh, British troops were sent to Boston, Massachusetts, in response to the anti-tax liberty riot, which followed the fining of the son of liberty, John Hancock, who was incidentally a very wealthy and prominent local merchant and tellingly smuggler. Uh, he'd violated the Townsend duties. So it seemed to Americans then that Britain really was intent on taking away their liberties by force. And things got worse with the Boston Massacre of the 5th of March 1770. Now that occurred as a crowd was harassing guards at the customs house and one of the British troops got knocked over and accidentally fired his musket. 
Um, no one really knows what happened next, but the panicked soldiers fired into the crowd, killing four men and a boy. Now, revolution didn't happen immediately after this event, and after the Boston Massacre, because of the shock, I think, there was what uh, the radical Bostonian Samuel Adams called a period of quiescence. Um, and that was helped by the fact that Parliament repealed all of the Townsend duties except for one. And I'll give you a moment just to guess what that was. So the door was left open to future, co uh, future controversy. And in May 1773, Parliament passes the Tea Act, which exempted the East India Company from the tea duty uh, which w and was intended to give the ailing company a monopoly of the lucrative American tea trade. All over the colonies, despite the prospect of cheaper tea, colonists subjected to their own local merchants being squeezed out of the market by a big monopoly company, and protesters acted to prevent the company from landing and selling its tea. The most famous incident was once again in Boston, a hotbed of rebellion, where a large crowd of local people dressed as Mohawk Indians boarded the East India Company ships and threw all of the tea they held, 90,000 pounds of it, into the Boston Harbour. Hence we have the Boston Tea Party of December the 16th, 1773. Now, Parliament wasn't going to take this lying down, and they responded in early 1774 with what they called the Coercive Acts, though the colonists rather informatively called them the Intolerable Acts. The Impartial Administration of Justice Act, which made up one of these Intolerable Acts, uh, provided for the trials of those involved in the Tea Party in England and without a jury. The Boston Port Act closed the harbour until the city compensated the East India Company. The Quartering Act billeted uh, British troops on people's homes in Boston. The Massachusetts Government Act imposed what amounted to martial law and made General Thomas Gage a military governor. And then there was the Quebec Act. This wasn't one of the coercive acts. But for the colonists, it was part of the Intolerable Acts, if that makes sense. And what that did was establish French law in the former French colony of New France, uh, meaning that that region which abutted the English colonies uh, would be ruled directly from London with none of the traditional English rights that the colonists took for granted. So it's at this point that the American empire began to collapse. For one thing, the members of the now abolished Massachusetts General Court simply carried on meeting in defiance of the Massachusetts Government Act, and eventually they declared themselves a provincial congress, stating that they derived their authority not from the British Crown, but from the people of Massachusetts. It was in effect a revolutionary government. Furthermore, delegates from most of the colonies met as a Continental Congress in September to October of 1774. This Congress adopted the Declaration and Resolves, presenting the colonists' grievances and warning Massachusetts itself not to take aggressive action, but also promising that region aid if it was attacked itself. The Congress also decided to reconvene the next May. Before it did so, however, war broke out between British troops, British troops and the colonists. On the 18th of April 1775, General Thomas Gage sent 700 soldiers from Boston to capture an illegal arms cache reputedly held in the town of Concord. The next morning, they were met by civil militia at Lexington Green. A firefight somehow erupted between the two parties. The British, by far the more numerous, 
killed eight colonial militiamen, wounded ten, and simply marched on. They'd stirred up a hornet's nest, and on their march to Concord Bridge, uh, they were met by much larger colonial local forces, and 14 British soldiers were killed. They were forced to retreat to Boston, constantly under fire, and eventually found themselves besieged in the town of Boston. From this, of course, you have the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill, which was fought on the 17th of June, 1775. Uh, it was a British victory, but a Pyrrhic victory. In reality, they lost half of their attacking force and would eventually be forced to leave Boston. But elsewhere, too, fighting had broken out, notably near the Canadian border and indeed in Virginia. Okay, so that's the broad context of the revolution. So now a little bit, uh, or I should say a significant focus on Pennsylvania. Now, I've given this particular section the heading of reluctant revolutionaries, Pennsylvania and the build-up to the revolution, and you will soon see why. Because Pennsylvania lagged behind the other American colonies in resisting British policies. As the colonial crisis escalated in the 1770s, the province's conservative Quaker leaders, who still held significant sway in local politics, particularly the colony's House of Assembly, continued to show little support for the colonists' efforts to oppose the mother country. In 1774, for instance, Governor John Penn refused to call the assembly in a failed attempt to prevent its members from electing delegates to the First Continental Congress. Uh, the following spring, the assembly failed to respond to the war's first battles at Lexington and Concord, which you know were fought near Boston, Massachusetts. The conservatism of Pennsylvania's traditional leaders therefore left an opening for the province's more radical residents to steer Pennsylvania toward revolution. Gradually, Pennsylvania's counties began to act, but their representatives in the Continental Congress nevertheless continued to drag their feet. Now, this was, it must be said, reflective at the time of a wider reluctance on the part of the colonists to declare independence. And those who finally did declare American independence didn't do so lightly. Even the radicals who favoured breaking from Britain knew that they would have to wait for widespread popular support to grow if they were to have any chance of success. And getting that right was literally a matter of life and death. As Benjamin Franklin, a Pennsylvanian, said to Congress, with a touch of gallows humour, we must all hang together or, most assuredly, we shall hang separately. This is why Congress waited and kept asserting its loyalty to the king. Gradually, though, the idea of an independence began to catch on. On the 16th of May 1775, soon after the war broke out, the Massachusetts Provincial Assembly requested that the Continental Congress draft a model constitution for all of the colonies. Congress refused at this stage to be pushed into a de facto declaration of independence, but it had set a, uh, a precedent. Now, even before the 4th of July 1776 then, uh, what we find is that New Hampshire, Georgia, North Carolina, and the Rhode Island assemblies followed the, uh, the example of Massachusetts and declared themselves to be provincial assemblies that derived their authority from the people of those provinces and not the king. Some went as far as amending or adopting new constitutions without any authorization from Britain, of course. And what we find is that these new constitutions were much more Republican, that is, more representative and responsible to the people. And examples of these included Massachusetts, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Virginia and New Jersey. 
Uh, Virginia, interestingly, even adopted a Declaration of Rights. And on April the 12th, North Carolina became the first to instruct its delegates in the Continental Congress to vote for independence, if in concert with others. And North Carolina was followed by Virginia in this regard on the 15th of May. So, there was increasing pressure on the Continental Congress from the individual colonies who were in favour of independence. So, let me just explain that. The individual colonies, many of them wanted independence and they were pushing their delegates to go down this route in the Continental Congress. Uh, there was, incidentally, much growing popular pressure too, especially with the publication of Thomas Paine's Common Sense on the 10th of January 1776. This made rather strident calls for immediate independence and advocated the establishment of an American Republic. Paine, incidentally, was an Englishman who had emigrated to Pennsylvania. Now, Common Sense went into 25 reprint editions and sold as many as 150,000 copies. That's when most pamphlets and newspapers only sold a few thousand. And no less a figure than George Washington, commander-in-chief of rebel forces and future first president of the United States, described Paine's common sense as working a powerful change in the minds of many men. He also stated that he persuaded them of the proprietary of separation. So the debate over American independence intensified in the late spring and early summer of 1776. Anticipating a vote on the issue, the Pennsylvania Assembly instructed the province's delegates to the Second Continental Congress to oppose independence. But that mandate brought 4,000 protesters to the state house yard in Philadelphia. So unpopular was the measure. Two weeks later, on the 7th of June 1776, Virginia delegate Richard Henry Lee introduced a resolution to the effect that these united colonies are, and of course, right ought to be, free and independent states. Three days later, Congress appoints a committee of five, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Pennsylvanian, Thomas Jefferson, Robert Livingston, and Roger Sherman to prepare an effect, uh, prepare a declaration to the effect of Lee's, uh, Lee's resolution. Thomas Jefferson was chosen as principal author because, uh, in short, he could write very well. John Adams said he had a peculiar felicity of expression. And he, with a Committee of Five's oversight then, would go on to compile the fabled Declaration of Independence. Now, during the first vote on the resolution, uh, July the 1st, 1776, the Pennsylvania delegation, a severely divided group led by Benjamin Franklin, initially voted against independence along with South Carolina delegates. However, the next day, Pennsylvania's delegates reluctantly followed the other colonies to declare America's separation from Great Britain. The Declaration of Independence, which was signed on the 4th of July 1776, was read for the first time on July the 8th in Philadelphia, very important uh, city or town, I should say, in the revolution. And uh, the, the declaration was read out before um, marching battalions of soldiers with bells ringing out into the night in celebration and commemoration. Two months later, the state convention adopted Pennsylvania's own first constitution, which was a remarkably democratic document that represented the last political step toward revolution in 
the colony. So the question is, why was the Pennsylvania Constitution in particular so radical? Well, it aspired to the democratic ideal of maximum participation by citizens, while it simultaneously ensured fair, just and legal representation by politicians. It created what's called a unicameral legislature, i.e. having only one body, and that was a feature unique among the American states, and I call them states now because after the 4th of July they declared their independence. Actually, they voted on Lee's resolution and passed it on the 2nd of July, 1776. Uh, leg legislators within the Pennsylvania um, uh, legislator, uh, legislature were to be persons, to quote, most noted for wisdom and virtue, and they were required to swear that they would do nothing injurious to the people. Again, the importance of the term the people. In an effort to rotate the largest number of people into and out of office, the rules mandated annual elections and limited terms, uh, a limited terms of service to four out of every seven years. Uh, the framers had two goals, to make representatives more responsive to the people and to allow bad politicians to be removed from office swiftly. To ensure participation by citizens, lawmaking itself was controlled. No bill could be enacted until it had been printed for general reading and, except in rare instances, until a year after its printing. No provision was made for a state governor. Instead, the executive function fell to an elected 12-member executive council. These members served staggered three-year terms making them ineligible for re-election until four years after their terms ended. Pennsylvania judges were not given independence. The legislature could revoke judgeships, which lasted seven years, and this could be done for misbehaviour and at any time. As an additional limitation on the judiciary, the Constitution created a special body called the Council of Censors, which met every seven years to review the constitutionality of laws. Perhaps most significantly, the, fran the voting franchise was extended to all men who had paid taxes. This was an innovation because it was somewhat less restrictive than a requirement that voters own property. The 40 shilling freehold had been a norm certainly in England and many American colonies. The rights granted by the Pennsylvania Constitution were among the most liberal in the United States at that time. However, despite its idealism, the Pennsylvania Constitution was neither a success at home nor outside of the state. Critics, for instance, complained about its heavy reliance on a revolving and extremely powerful legislature. Influential forces in the state, particularly those in business, attacked the uncertain conditions that it created for commerce. The Federalists, who believed in a strong federal government, detested its independence. Lawyers and judges decried the weakened judiciary. So by 1790, the experiment had ended. The state replaced the Constitution with one modelled on the US Constitution's separation of powers and its adherence to the idea of a republic. But nonetheless, the Pennsylvania Constitution for that time it existed was very revolutionary and in some ways foresighted indeed. Okay, so looking at the War of Independence and Pennsylvania. Now, Pennsylvania's communities, despite the reluctance of the Quaker elites, had actually begun preparing for war as early as 1774. Counties and towns established what were called committees of correspondence to consider the growing crisis 
and they raised, as I mentioned earlier, volunteer companies of soldiers known as associators to prepare for the possibility of war. In June 1775, the Pennsylvania Assembly formalised the colony's preparations by establishing a committee of safety to coordinate the defence of the province and to um, provide for the provisioning of the province's soldiers. The Militia Law of 1777 replaced volunteer associators with mandatory militia units. They were charged with defending Pennsylvania and suppressing civil disorder, uh, and they did so for the duration of the revolution. Now, because of the fact that the Continental Congress sat in Philadelphia, and because of its uh, symbolic and strategic significance, war, the War of Independence, deeply affected Pennsylvania. Philadelphia is like the capital city, almost, of the revolution. Hostilities, therefore, largely or to a great degree, I should say, centred around the defence of Philadelphia. As I said, the American capital, which the British sought to capture and did so in the year 1777. Uh, so what we see is that in Pennsylvania, there were a series of engagements at Brandywine, Germantown, Pauli, uh, and the British army repeatedly defeats General George Washington's troops in these engagements. And as I say, they'd occupy Philadelphia through the winter of 1777 through to 1778, while the beaten but not destroyed Continental Army, i.e. the Rebel Army, encamped nearby at the infamous Valley Forge. Now, it was in response to the British invasion on occupation of Philadelphia that the Continental Congress retreated to Baltimore, then Lancaster and York to avoid capture by their, by their enemy. Um, in the meantime, during the occupation, Pennsylvania's Patriot government attempted to suppress the influence of Philadelphia's loyalists. And remember, just like the colonies more widely, uh, Pennsylvania was deeply divided between Patriots, Rebels, or in other words, Tories and Loyalists. Now, after the British evacuated Pennsylvania in June 1778, the main focus of the war shifts to New Jersey before heading south. On Pennsylvania's western and northern frontiers, the revolution then complicates existing struggles that would linger after the war's end. Settlers in western Pennsylvania received little protection during the revolution, and the same was true, of course, of the French and Indian War. So they were forced, for example, to fend off Virginians who competed for their land. And most especially, they faced the threat of Indian raids via the Iroquois, Shawnee, and Delaware Indians, who all, the latter of whom, wanted to retaliate for Western expansion, and they did so with raids such as the one that destroyed Hannestown in 1782. In the Wyoming Valley in northeastern Pennsylvania, where a significant proportion of the Loyalist population lived, similar style battles occurred over competing land claims by Connecticut and Pennsylvania settlers and local Iroquois Indians. So the War of Independence lasted for eight long years. And though it resulted in American independence, the costs of the revolution affected the new nation for decades. The United States emerged from the war with uncertain finances and debts uh, that it owed to veterans of the re revolution, many of whom hadn't received the military pay or pensions to them uh, and that were owed to them for their service. For the most part, the federal government didn't compensate its Revolutionary War veterans until the 19th century. This crisis afflicted enlisted men and officers alike. 
Indeed, Pennsylvania's highest ranking continental officer, Arthur Sinclair, died in poverty because he failed to receive the pay he had earned through his service. For many Pennsylvania loyalists who remained in the province throughout the war, their allegiance cost them their property, livelihood and even their freedom. Those who refused to take the state's oath of allegiance to the new nation were deprived of their voting rights and were occasionally jailed or exiled. Rather than endure these conditions, more than 1,000 Pennsylvania loyalists, most of them English-born Quakers and Anglicans, fled to England, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in the 1780s. The unresolved tensions with American Indians on the western frontiers lingered longest with the new American government. As settlers pressed west into the Northwest Territory from Pennsylvania, Virginia and other states, Western Indians continued their efforts to protect their ancestral lands. These efforts increasingly turned violent, culminating in 1791 in what became known as St. Clair's defeat. In short, in present day Ohio, Miami Indians devastated a force of US soldiers under the Revolutionary War veteran Arthur St. Clair. The American Army's victory three years later in the Battle of Fallen Timbers encouraged more Western settlement, but did not avoid the conflicts with American Indians that would consume the 19th century and Pennsylvanian Native Americans after the revolution just like Native Americans elsewhere in the American colonies increasingly get pushed westward off their traditional tribal homelands by land hungry settlers and despite the American victory that was celebrated and has been celebrated in the United States since uh, the War of Independence we must also sometimes remember the cost that was borne by others, including, for example, the Loyalists, but especially uh, Native American tribes. And that's true of Pennsylvania, as I say, as elsewhere um, in the newly independent United States. Uh, before I close this particular lecture, I want to draw your attention to the final slide. This gives you an indication of some of the significant battles that were fought in Pennsylvania. Brandywine for me stands out but also Powley um, and the siege of Fort Mifflin but there you can see um, Pennsylvania was a crucial point, a crucial focal point for a significant portion of the American Revolution and War of Independence. So do take a little bit of time to look through this slide and if you wish look up some of those particular battles. Okay, that's the lecture for today. Thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions, please do let me know.